All right, good morning and welcome to our second service on Sunday mornings. We have two services, the first of which is our Bible prophecy update, and then second service, which is our verse by verse study through the Bible. Today we find ourselves in the book of Titus. We're going through this book, this epistle to Titus from the Apostle Paul. And Lord willing, today we will finish chapter 1. Our text will be verses 9 through 16. We'd invite you at this time to turn there if you're not already there. And for those of you that are here, if you're able, I'll ask you to stand. If not, where you're seated is fine, but you can follow along as I read. Beginning in verse 9, the Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, writing to Titus, says, He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. For there are, verse 10, many rebellious people full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. Verse 12, one of the Cretes' own prophets has said it, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. This saying is true. (laughs) Therefore, rebuke them sharply, so that they will be sound in the faith, and will pay no attention to the Jewish myths, or to the merely human commands of those who reject the truth. To the pure, verse 15, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny Him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. I think that's self-explanatory. We can just close in prayer and let's pray. Oh Lord, we uh, readily admit that this portion that we have open before us here this morning in Your Word is one that we desperately need for the Holy Spirit to bless to our understanding. Lord, we, that's why we're here. We're here to hear You speak into our lives, in and through Your Word. And so Lord, as You do, please, I pray that the Holy Spirit would get and hold and keep our attention so our minds don't wander. There is nothing more that the enemy would want than to distract us and keep us from that which You have for us here today. So Lord, speak. Your servants are listening. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. I want to talk with you today about the importance of asking ourselves some honest questions concerning both who we are and how we act as Christians. The text before us today is one of those places in God's Word that I think we would do well to ask why we even have it in our Bibles. Would you agree? I mean, it's one of those passages where if you're anything like me, and I suspect that you are, you're prone to just kind of read through it real fast. And, you know, he's just mentioning a bunch of names and some issues apparently that uh, they were having there in that church. And so really it doesn't necessarily apply to me today. But the problem is, 
we know from 2 Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, we don't like that, correcting and training in righteousness. So it has to be here for a reason. And so we should ask ourselves why. Why do we have this in our Bibles? I would suggest that one of the reasons we do is because just as there were troublemakers in the church then, troublemakers are alive and well in the church today. And don't look at the person sitting next to you. We're of course talking about other churches, not you. You guys are perfect. Not so fast. (laughs) After inquiring of the Lord as to how He would have me to teach this passage, I sensed that I was to approach it by posing several questions, ten questions actually. Questions that we need to ask ourselves, honestly ask ourselves, and in so doing, permit the Holy Spirit unfettered access to our hearts to search our hearts. Before we jump in, I want to just, by way of a preface, say one more thing. You know how it is when you hear a sermon or sit under the teaching of God's Word, you're quick to, prone to think, about somebody else needing to hear this? Oh, somebody just came to mind, just as I said that, right? Oh, this is good. I'm going to send them the link. They need to hear this. No, right? Come on, let's be honest. The problem with that, and I think you already know where I'm going with this, just by virtue of the title of today's sermon. Maybe I'm the one that needs to hear this. You know how it is when you're in books like the book of Proverbs? This is a really good example. We've actually studied through the book of Proverbs on Thursday nights in our trek through the Bible. And when we hit the contrasting Proverbs, you know, the Proverbs that in the teens, those chapters where the righteous is contrasted with the wicked, And so the proverb will say something to the effect of, the righteous do this, but the wicked do that. And we, in our piety and indignance, we become incensed. Those wicked, I would never do that. That's you, you're the one. It's, it's the Holy Spirit, the prophet Nathan in your life saying, you are the man, you are the woman. So that's, that's my preface. If you want to leave, we'll bow our heads and close our eyes. You can slip out and we won't notice or say anything. We'll just pray for you. Let's start with the first one. It's in verse 9. Here's the question. We need to ask ourselves, honestly, am I a fighter? While still speaking about the qualifications of elders, Paul says that they were to disprove, refute those who would oppose sound doctrine. This is a preemptive and decisive act on the part of the elders in the church in that day. They weren't just to let it go. They were to take them on, head on, face to face, eyeball to eyeball, belly to belly, so to speak. And the reason is because there was much in the way of opposition to sound biblical doctrine, which by the way, is one of the reasons that Paul left Titus there in Crete, so that he could appoint elders to deal with these problems and these troublemakers. 
apparently there was a lot of opposition. And it seems that it came from those who were just looking for a fight. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, they're, they just, they're just looking for an argument. One has to wonder what the Holy Spirit would have inspired Paul to write to Titus if they had social media back then. Think about that. That's what social media has become. Would you agree? I know I've mentioned it before, and I hope you don't tire of me saying it, but I am quite frankly grieved and even embarrassed by the posts on the part of Christians on social media. And is it any wonder that the Church of Jesus Christ is in the condition that it's in today? The question I've had to ask, and I've asked it of myself, is if I were to post something like that, how is it that I expect to share Jesus Christ with them after I just called them a name and engaged in an argument with them. I've blown it. How, how can I, because isn't it true that in this day in which we are living, <laughs> that there is little time, really no time, to get as many people to Jesus, and Jesus to as many people as we possibly can. I like how one said it, many Christians are a really bad advertisement for Christ. We're ambassadors, we're representatives as Christians. And I think that there's this lost jewel of discernment within Christianity today. Discerning between whether or not somebody's looking for an argument or an answer. If somebody's looking for an argument, and they are, you need look no further than social media. It's actually, uh, there's a physiological explanation behind it, but more importantly, there's a spiritual explanation behind it. This is a spiritual battle, a spiritual war, and we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So there's this need to discern, is this person genuinely asking a question for which they seek an answer? Or are they actually wanting a fight? And it seems that there in Crete, Titus was dealing with a lot of people, antagonists, if you will. And this actually ties into our second question in the first part of verse 10. And it's, am I rebellious? Not only were there many antagonists, looking for arguments and not answers, so too were there many rebellious people as well. It's important to understand that to be rebellious is a demonstration of one's unwillingness to subordinate and submit to authority. And I'll tell you, I, over the years, in my experience on the mainland, I never use examples from here, obviously. <laughs> it's been my experience both in the pastorate and not in the pastorate. When you have a church where people are not submitted to authority and there's a spirit of rebellion, 
That's not a church you want to be in. And it has to be addressed. And it has to be confronted. Because it's like a cancer, it can spread. And that's why it has to be dealt with. And that's the seriousness with which Paul is addressing the matter. Now again, I want to, by way of that preface, mention that it's so easy, right, to think about people that maybe you know that are rebellious people, antagonists, always looking for a fight. But it is so important to allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts to see if there be any wicked way. And then if the Lord finds something that has taken up residence in our Christian lives, He's very gentle about it. As only He can, let Him put His finger on it, and then let Him remove it. Because if you don't let Him remove it, it will destroy you. It will destroy your life. It will destroy your marriage. It will destroy your relationships. I've seen churches destroyed in the wake of this. I've seen pastors destroyed in the wake of this. I've seen marriages destroyed in the wake of this. I've seen children who want nothing to do with God, the things of God, certainly the church of God, because of this. And if you really think about it, the world watches this and says of this, no thank you, no thank you. That's what is, that's what the church is like. That's how Christians treat each other. Here's the third one. This is a biggie. <laughs> Second part of verse 10. Am I a talker? No, I'm not, but so-and-so is. Man, I see them come and I know I've got to go the other way or else I'm stuck for two hours. I'm not talking necessarily about that. Stay with me. Here, Paul describes them as, interesting, being full of meaningless talk, which to me has a twofold meaning. The first of which is to talk too much. And second is when they talk too much, they really aren't saying anything. You know what I mean? It's, it's like, they just talk, and talk, and talk, and talk, and then they just keep talking, and then they keep talking, and talking, and they're not really saying anything, and they're just talking, and kind of repeating themselves, and talking, kind of like I am right now. <laughs> These people were talkers who basically had nothing to say, nothing of any value. And it does seem as if that they did this because they just wanted to hear themselves talk. And not only that, but they are those who believe that what they have to say is more important than what you have to say. You know how when you're in a conversation with somebody like that. I know somebody just came to mind just when I said that, and that's fine, whatever. And you're talking, and you're actually you're not talking because you can't get a word in edgewise, because they're doing all the talking. Talk, 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 talk. And you're trying to, you know, be polite, and you know, you're actually not even really listening, because you're not really saying anything. And so you try to insert the hmm, and oh, and oh, is that right, in the right spot. And then you mess up, and they catch you. And they say, wait, I asked you a question. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, what did you say? <laughs> Actually, you didn't say anything. That's why I wasn't listening. And so then they let you talk. And as you're talking, you know what they're doing? They're thinking about what they're going to say next. They're not listening to what you have to say. 
what I'm trying to say is, at the core of this is spiritual pride. Fancying oneself as being more important than the other. Thinking of oneself more highly than they ought. Question number four. Am I deceived? Third part of verse 10. I thought, in fact, I actually changed it. At first, the question was going to be, am I a deceiver? And here's why I changed it to, am I deceived? Because deceivers deceive because they're deceived. That's not a play on words. Let me try that again. Wasn't in my notes. That was my first mistake. That's why I should stick close to my notes. If you are deceived, guess what? You will deceive. So if you're deceived, by default, you will be a deceiver. Why? Because you're deceived. Deceivers deceived. So the question is, and this is a good question, and we need to ask ourselves this question, am I deceived? Here, Paul adds deception to those who were full of meaningless talk. And he refers specifically to those of the circumcision group. You know who these were? These were the Judaizers that Paul was warning Titus about. Man, these guys were trouble with a capital T. They were deceivers. They themselves were deceived, and they were deceiving whole households and disrupting whole households. And that's our next question in the first part of verse 11. Am I disruptive? I find it interesting that Paul would mention these people disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach. The truth of the matter is, there will always be those who fancy themselves as being knowledgeable, know-it-alls. Oh, you can't tell them anything. They'll tell you a thing or two, because they know it all. And what do we know to be true about those who know it all? Knowledge puffs up. And not only does knowledge puff up, it also disrupts. Question number six. Honest question. Am I dishonest? Second part of verse 11. Paul's mention of dishonest gain certainly applies to those who were in it for the money and financial gain. No shortage of those today, <laughs> sadly. But I would argue that it can also apply to gaining followers. Again, hear me out and stay with me. What do I mean by that? Well, in Crete there were those who sought to draw disciples unto themselves. And as Paul refers to them in the book of Acts, these are wolves in sheep's clothing. I'd like to read Acts chapter 20, verses 25 through 31. I'd encourage you to join me there in your Bibles. This is perhaps amongst the most emotional and even powerful passages in Scripture concerning the intensity of the Apostle Paul. He's bidding farewell. He knows this will be the last time he sees them there. And these are his parting words, and they're sobering. Listen to what he says, verse 25. 
He says, now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you. And here's why, verse 27, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole counsel of God, the whole Word of God. And then here's the warning, verse 28. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which He bought with His own blood. I know that after I leave, verse 29, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. And then he says this, verse 30, the, th- verse 30 and this makes the what little hair I have left on the back of my neck stick up. He says, even from your own number within your church, from within, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Oh, I'm so glad that God inspired Luke to write these words of Paul, especially in verse 31. It just gives us a snapshot into the heart of the Apostle Paul. Did you just hear what he just said? For three years, every day, every night, all day, all night, he would warn them and weeping that after he left, there would be these wolves that would come in from among them, and they would not spare the flock. And the way you can discern and determine and spot a wolf is that they will draw disciples to themselves. Here's what that looks like, sounds like, and I'll even say smells like. (laughs) You know it doesn't smell right when somebody comes up to you after the teaching, after the service, says, hey, (laughs) right right away, right there. (laughs) Be on guard. (laughs) And they're really smooth and they come off so spiritual, emphasis added. And they'll say something to the effect of, wow, that was really a good teaching. Yeah, it was really good. Thank you very much. (laughs) No, not that. But here it comes. Do you really want to go deep into the Word? What do you mean? Oh, we have this uh, Bible study. It's only for those who really want to go deep in the Word. That's a wolf. That's a wolf. Drawing disciples unto themselves to gain followers after themselves. It's dishonest. It's despicable disgraceful. And (laughs) verses 12 and 13, this one's interesting, has to deal with our reputation. I think again of the Proverbs that says that it is better to have a good name and a good reputation than it is to have a lot of wealth. So here's the question, am I disreputable? So here, Paul is referring to a saying in that day, 
some commentators actually uh, mention the name of this guy that was known for this saying concerning the reputation that Cretans had for being liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. I mean, they even had a saying, because they had such a bad reputation, they would say of people, you're such a Cretan. That was not a compliment. Because to call somebody a Cretan was to say of them that they were liars, they were gluttons, they were savage, they were brutal, and they were lazy. How about that, you Cretan? Wow, <laughs> that's pretty bad. I want you to know something though. Notice that Paul doesn't tell Titus to have nothing to do with them. He, he doesn't say of them that they're to be treated as were the rebellious antagonists that were causing all the fights and problems. They were to be confronted. But here Paul tells Titus, instead of having nothing to do with them, that he's to rebuke them sharply, not for the sake of rebuking them, with the purpose of them coming to a sound doctrine in the faith. That's the purpose of it. You need to sharply rebuke them, but with this in mind, that they will be sound in the faith. I'm reminded of what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. It's convicting and it needs to be. But this was a carnal church, a worldly church. And it sounds from what Paul writes in his first epistle that they thought of themselves that they were all that, as we would say. And Paul has to rebuke them sharply, as he tells Titus to do with the elders he appoints in the church there. And here's what he says to them, remember, you were one of them, as were some of you. And you know what the context of that is? He's talking about people there in Corinth that were homosexuals, that were living lives of debauchery and hedonism. You see, you were like that before you came to Christ, as were some of you. And it was when somebody cared enough and loved you enough to rebuke you sharply that you came to the truth and you came to Christ. That's what you need to do with them. We don't like that, do we? You know why? Because we want people to like us. And if we sharply rebuke them, they'll unfriend us, unfollow us, and block us. Right? I want to spend a little bit of time on the eighth question in verse 14. And it's the question of, am I legalistic? <laughs> Again, this is a biggie. I don't know if it's possible to overstate how dangerous legalism is. And the reason I say it like that is because legalism has this built-in propensity to bring people back into bondage under the law. And I'll take it a step further and suggest that legalism gets dangerously close to blasphemy such that it negates the finished work on the cross. Because here's what legalism says, it is finished, comma, it is finished if, it is finished but, it is finished when. See, now you're adding 
a legalistic requirement under the law. It's not finished then. That's blasphemy. That's blasphemy. It is at best a slap in the face of the Savior Himself. May it never be. Legalism is a killer, literally. The law kills, but the Spirit gives life. I think about the account in the book of Exodus when the law came down with Moses from Mount Sinai. You remember that? 3,000 people died. Here's Moses with the Ten Commandments, the two tablets. They'd already broken them. And then <laughs> symbolically the tablets themselves were broken. 3,000 Israelites died when the law came down. Fast forward to the aforementioned book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit came down. 3,000 people got saved. That's not a coincidence. The law kills. Legalism kills. The Spirit gives life. Number nine, am I corrupted? Here in verse 15, Paul says that there were those whose minds and consciences were corrupted. And as such, everything they viewed and everyone they viewed was corrupted as well. To the corrupt, all things are corrupted. But conversely, for those who were walking in the purity and the liberty of Christ, all things that the legalists would forbid were pure and permitted. Let me expound on that just a little bit. There's more to this when you peel back the layers on this. You know how it is when somebody's a liar. I mean, we have terms for them, pathological liars. I mean, these are professional liars. These, th these are people that have a PhD in lying. These are, they're so good at lying, they believe their own lies. That's a liar. Apparently there was a fair share of them there in Crete, as Paul would say. But if you're a liar, not you, I'm not talking about you, and I've got to be careful when I say it, because sometimes I'll point, if you, and then people over here are all crawling underneath the chairs, so I'll not do that. I'll, I'll, here, I'll just, just do this. So <laughs> I'm, I'm talking broadly, hypothetically, of course, rhetorically even. If you're a liar, don't you see everybody else as a liar? If you're a liar and you're talking to somebody, because you're a liar, you think they're a liar too. And it works both ways. If you're honest and you're walking in integrity, you naively believe that everyone else is also walking in integrity because your mind is not corrupted. You don't think that way. You think because you're honest and you, you wouldn't lie or cheat, that the person you're dealing with, they're not going to, they wouldn't do that. Oh, oh, yes, they would and are. You know, sometimes uh, Christians can be so gullible, so naive, Many years ago, I, again, I'm only using illustrations from the mainland. <laughs> and actually, this was before I was in the ministry and started my uh, church. I was in business. And this is back in the day when Christian business directories were a big thing. So you had the, you know, directory of Christian owned businesses. Because after all, you want to do business with Christians, right? Keep it in the family. I don't think that's right, because we're supposed to be salt and light. And if I only do business with Christians, then how am I ever going to be a witness to the world? Actually, I want to share this. I think this might be the Holy Spirit. Um, again, many, many years ago, um, I, I, the guy that 
did my hair. <laughs> I'm using a hair <laughs> illustration, but it, it just bear with me. Um, he, he left, and so I was looking for a hairdresser. And at the time I, I had more hair, and, it, and my hair is not easy hair to cut. In fact, actually I, I should have been looking for a landscaper, because all you really need is a... <laughs> so I prayed, and I, and I thought, okay, you know, I want to find a hairdresser that's not a Christian, and I want to witness to them. And, uh, you know, <laughs> of course, I'm not off to a very good start. I walk in. I remember one time I walked in, you know, it's a big, you know, sandwich board, walk-ins welcome. I had a big afro. I walked in, and they looked at me and said, we don't have any openings. <laughs> I was really quite traumatized by that, actually. So I'm looking for a hairdresser, and I prayed. And then I, at the time, again, this is going to date me as a many years ago, land far, far away, long time ago, once upon a time, I looked in the phone book, and I started calling. And I asked, you know, I, I need a hairdresser that is familiar with and good with my, my kind of hair, you know, like that can cut a Brillo pad, basically, <laughs> yes, you know. And so I, I called a couple places, and, and to their credit, they were honest. They're like, yeah, you know, we really don't have anybody. <laughs> Do you have a sign that says, walk-ins, welcome to? Anyway, so I called the next one on the list, and sure enough, I get a hold of this one place, and uh, she says, I have just the person for you. So I scheduled an appointment, went in. She cut my hair, did a great job, got to know her, went back a couple more times, and she gave her life to Christ as a result of it. I only share that because if we're going to be salt and light, we're in the world, but not of the world, right? But back in that day, <laughs> there were those who would put a fish in their yellow page ad just to get the Christians who were so gullible and get their business. And then they would just take them to the cleaners. They're not Christians. But they knew that Christians were loyal and gullible and wanted to do business with other Christians. Oh, you're a Christian too? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> These are the kind of people that were there in Crete in that day, and dare I say, they're alive and well today. Last question, and we'll spend the remainder of our time on this one. In verse 16, <laughs> I'm already busted on, you know, the other questions. So if you were doing pretty good up until this point, Gotcha! <laughs> I got me too. Am I disobedient? One can't help but take note of the strength with which Paul writes this, saying that these people were detestable, disobedient, and disqualified. Wow. Being obedient rises to the level of being detestable. And being disobedient can also disqualify me. You better believe it. Think King Saul. I want to actually close with the account of Samuel confronting King Saul, sharply rebuking King Saul, if you prefer. But before we do, there's one more question that I want to ask. And I want you to think this through with me. It's not a trick question. It might seem like it at first. Here's the question. What's the one thing that you and I can give to God that He doesn't necessarily already have? You know how it is when you're trying to figure out, what gift do I buy the person that has everything? Well, God has everything. No, He doesn't. 
What's the one thing that God does not necessarily have? Our obedience. What's the one thing that we can give to God that would bless the heart of God? Our obedience. That's why obedience is better than sacrifice. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 15. If you want to turn there, I want to read verses 17 through 23. Again, very sobering. And I think we would do well to allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts. So, verse 17, Samuel said, When you were little, speaking to Saul, in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, verse 20, listen to his excuse and response. But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me, and brought back Agag, king of Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the plunder, sheep and oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice to the Lord, your God, in Gilgal. <laughs> Translate it. I know I didn't quite do all that God commanded me to do. I know that I kind of disobeyed and, you know, in this one little area, just a little thing. Talked about this last week, didn't we? Maybe it was Thursday night. We don't like to call sin, sin anymore. We uh, really take the edge off it and soften it up and call sin things like issues. You just have, you know, some issues. No, you have sin, sin. Call it sin. Because when you call it sin, then God can forgive it and cleanse it. If you call it an issue, what you're saying is, hands off, just a small issue over here. That's what <laughs> Saul's doing here. Ah, come on. Lighten up, Samuel. What's the big deal? I just, we just took a little, and of course we're going to sacrifice it to the Lord. What's wrong with that? I have a word for it. You know what that word is? Oh, we're really good at it. You ready? Wait for it. It's called justification. We justify it. Oh, it, it's okay. And we justify our disobedience and our sin. Well, Samuel's response, verse 22. So Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion, listen to this, is as the sin of witchcraft. And oh, by the way, <laughs> he did that. Remember? And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Stop right there. What? 
Stubbornness? Yeah. I'm kind of stubborn sometimes. And so are you too, so don't look at me all spiritual. <laughs> do, do, do you realize that when we're stubborn, it's as iniquity and idolatry? That's not good. <laughs> That's really bad. Or as we say, very bad, very, very bad. <laughs> Stubbornness. We don't think of stubbornness. You know, I'm a little thick-headed. <laughs> yeah, nice try. You're full of iniquity and idolatry. That's what stubbornness is in the sight of the Lord. And then he says this, and I cannot even begin to imagine, because after this it was all downhill for Saul. He would never be the same again. The kingdom is going to be torn from him and given to a young boy, his name David. And he says this to Samuel, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. I wish there was a better way to end the sermon, but there's not. I say this of myself, please know this, but perhaps it's incumbent upon us to revisit our stubbornness and disobedience in the sight of the Lord, and to again allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts and see if there be any wicked, stubborn, rebellious ways in us, whatever it is that would keep us from knowing Him, loving Him, hearing Him. And again, never imagine that God is full of wrath or anger or vindictive with us. He's very gentle. It's for our own good. It would be akin to going to the doctor and having the doctor say, you've got cancer and we need to cut it out or it's going to kill you. So we let the doctor cut us open and take out that which has the potential to kill us. And so too is God's Word sharper than any two-edged sword, see it as a surgical instrument to perform spiritual surgery, to remove the sin of cancer in our lives before it kills us. One last thing. I did pretty good today with the last things, actually. This will be one last thing. And I think it's just, I mean, it brings it full circle. Do you know how Saul would ultimately die? It would be at the hands of an Amalekite. Think about this. He was commanded to utterly destroy the Amalekites before the Amalekites destroyed them. And that is what the Spirit would say to us as His church today. Destroy the Amalekite of sin in your life before it destroys you. Had Saul but obeyed the command of the Lord, it would have ended so differently. But his life would come to a tragic end at the hand of the very one that God had commanded him to destroy. That's the grace and mercy of God. That's the love of God who loves us so much. He's trying to protect us from that which would destroy us. Why don't you stand and we'll close in prayer. We'll have the worship team come up at this time before we do. <laughs> Uh, 
This is what you get when you go through the Word, right? You can't skip over stuff like this. <laughs> hey, believe you me, if I taught topically and I didn't teach expositionally, verse by verse, line upon line through the Bible, I wouldn't have taught this chapter. Are you kidding me? <laughs> but oh, it's good. It's a hard word. Okay, one last, last thing. You know the account in the Gospels when Jesus is teaching, it's a hard teaching, and the multitudes bail on Him. And Jesus looks to the disciples and, and He asks them, are you going to bail too? I love Peter. Peter responds, <laughs> um, no. And then He says, where else are we going to go? Yeah, it's a hard teaching, but you alone have the words of life. You know what that tells me? He thought about it. I mean, picture the scene. Jesus is teaching, and I mean, it's really a hard teaching. And people are like getting up and walking out of the middle of the sermon. <laughs> you don't do that. Thank you very much for not doing that. I take that very personally. I actually go home in the afternoon, I just break down and cry whenever somebody leaves. But that's what they were doing. They were just walking out, leaving, bailing. And they basically all left. <laughs> and you got to know, Peter's looking at him going, they're all leaving. I want to leave too. <laughs> this is really, this is, he thought about it. And Jesus knew it. And that's why Jesus asked him. But for Peter, to his credit, to say, yeah, that's a hard teaching, but it's needful. It's hard, but it's good. I, don't, I may not want to hear this, but I need to hear this. And I need to ask myself these questions. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much. Tough stuff, but good stuff, Lord. Thank You for the Holy Spirit searching our hearts. Lord, we know it's because You love us so much, and You don't want anything that would hurt us, harm us, injure us, certainly destroy us. So Lord, we take our hands off in our obstinance, our pride, our stubbornness, and we give You full access, Lord. Do as You will, according to Your good pleasure. We're the clay in Your hands as the potter. You mold us and You shape us according to Your will. While we're waiting, yielded, submitted, and still. In Jesus' name.